Well, hello again. Thank you for tuning in for our next study in our series, New Life in Christ. Uh, I do hope that uh, the study last week was beneficial for you and a blessing to you. Uh, it's always, for me, a great reminder and an encouragement when I think of the blessings that I have in Christ uh, as a new creation. Uh, as I remember those blessings of new life, it really helps to keep my life, my eyes, and my mind in perspective. It keeps me focused and it keeps me clear uh, when I look at the temporal versus the eternal, and especially during those times of trials and challenges, uh, because it helps me to understand that the things in this world uh, are not everything, that they're not permanent, and that I cannot allow uh, what happens in this world, whether it's good or bad, uh, to take my focus off of Christ and take my focus off of the eternal and the blessings that I have in Him. So it's always a great reminder for me, uh, no matter how many times I've read those passages, it's a blessing uh, to be reminded of the wonderful things that I have in Christ as a new creation. And I hope that it's been a blessing to you as well. You know, speaking of trials and challenges, many of you know that uh, we have had ours uh, in the past couple of weeks, and uh, we're still not over with it yet. We have to look at some, uh, the finalization of some major repairs to my truck. Um, but as I was looking at uh, my notes, uh, just various notes over the past few years, I came across some notes that I found from January 2012, so it was about eight and a half years ago. And uh, it's pretty interesting. I kind of wrote this down as I was uh, studying. That's what I saw in my notes. I must have been kind of uh, thinking about what was going on in the week. And uh, it was New Year's Eve, so it actually started in December uh, of 2011. And I made a note to myself that Timothy, our second oldest son, was sick. And we took him to the hospital, and he was uh, tested and diagnosed with strep throat. And then I wrote down that a couple of days later, uh, Monique felt sick. And she also came down with strep throat. And a couple of days later after that, uh, Tabitha felt sick. And she was diagnosed with strep throat. A couple of days after Tabitha, Robert gets sick, our oldest. He's diagnosed with strep throat. Uh, I don't know how I missed it, but I didn't get it apparently, according to my notes. But after Robert was diagnosed with strep throat, uh, I found out that I needed a root canal. And that's never fun, and it's never inexpensive. A couple of days later, after the uh, root canal um, notice that I had from my dentist, uh, we found out that Joshua, our youngest, who was about two years old at that time, uh, had an ear infection and strep throat. And then as I went on to those uh, notes, I saw that we also had to deal with uh, a problem that our insurance company made with a very large copayment. Uh, they charged us more than we should have paid, and it was difficult to try to get that money uh, back. I also had a note in there uh, that said that our, our van tires needed to be replaced. They were bald and they were unsafe. And so we had to put money out for that. And not, that was all in the course of maybe 10 days. And then there was just one phrase that I had in there as I kind of finalized those notes. And all I wrote down was, when it rains, it pours. I don't know exactly what I was thinking at that time, but I know I must have been a little bit frustrated to see my entire family sick, to know that I needed some very expensive dental work done, uh, that the insurance company had made a mistake, that our tires needed to be replaced. And I'm thinking, I'm sure uh, this is not good timing. Where are we going to get the money for this? It is all hitting us at once. Uh, I just know the way that I think, and I would imagine that I would be thinking the same way. Uh, pretty overwhelmed. Uh, possibly a little anxious, and uh, I don't exactly remember how I felt at that time, but I'm sure uh, that I wasn't feeling very happy or joyful. Um, that is, if I wasn't focusing on Christ. You know, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed and anxious and depressed. I mean, you name it, whatever feelings of emotions that we have when we respond to these difficult situations in life, we've probably experienced them. Uh, you know, we need to be lifelong students of God's Word. And I say that because when we are experiencing the difficulties in this life, we need to remember the promises of God's Word. If we remember what God has promised to us, we remember what we have now in the present and what God has in store for us in the future, it very much helps us during both peaceful and happy times and times of challenge and despair. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to chip away at our joy and hope in Christ. I mean, there's so many things in this fallen world uh, that can cause us to lose joy and hope. 
Uh, but what we have in Christ is so much greater than what we have in this world. Knowing who we are in Christ, knowing that we have new life in Christ, these promises uh, can help us from stumbling into that pit of depression and anxiety. We need those regular daily reminders of the blessings of our salvation. Uh, and as we remember those blessings, it will help to keep the, the flames of our joy burning brightly. You know, the power of God's word and the promises it contains, they cannot be overcome by this world. And that's a truth that the Apostle Paul knew very well. This morning, as we continue our study in New Life in Christ, we're going to look at a passage in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. So if you would, open your Bibles and follow along as we read through our text for this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 says, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. You know, this passage in Second Thessalonians really is a wonderful passage. I think it's it's one of the great passages that will help Christians who are experiencing uh, anxiety or despair or uncertainty because of trials and tribulations. It, it will help them to find peace. It will help them to have assurance that no matter what happens in this world, as bad as it gets, uh, the blessings that they have in Christ cannot be overcome and that we can cling to those. You know, when you read Second Thessalonians, it really is a book about faith and perseverance. There are a lot of references that we see in there uh, that we would say are references to end times, and, and I agree with that. They absolutely are. But, but I think the greater focus there is not so much the specifics of the end times, but that the people of God can have great faith and peace and hope and can persevere knowing that God has called them, that God has chosen them, that God has saved them and he has a purpose for them. And not even the end times or the Antichrist himself can take those promises away. And so Paul is, is really trying to encourage his brethren in Thessalonica as he is writing about these current trials that they were involved in and the tribulations that were to come. Uh, he spoke about these future trials at the hand of a person known as the man of lawlessness. We know this person to be as the coming Antichrist. Let me share with you just a little bit about what Paul says this Antichrist or man of lawlessness will be like and why it was such a concern for his brethren in Thessalonica. You know, as Paul wrote to his brethren, he said that this man of lawlessness, this Antichrist, will rise to power during the period known as the Great Tribulation, that he's coming at an end time that this man of lawlessness will rise to power and he will deceive the nations. Uh, consider what some verses in chapter 2 say about the acts of this great man of lawlessness. Chapter 2 verse 3 says that he's going to commit a great act of apostasy. That act of apostasy is going to be the beginning of that tribulation period. Uh, chapter 2 verse 7 says that the restrainer will be taken away. This restrainer, many believe to be the Holy Spirit that resides in the church, who dwells within the church. So when the church is taken up out of this world, the Holy Spirit goes with the church. And because the Spirit's restraint is gone, this man of lawlessness is going to have what seems like free reign over the entire planet. Chapter 2, verse 9 says that his works are in accord with the power and activity of Satan. So this man is going to act under the direct influence of Satan himself. Chapter 2 verse 10 says that he will bring every sort of deception upon the world. He's going to deceive the nations. They're going to believe his lies. They're going to embrace uh, what they believe or the truth that he's teaching, and he's going to lead them straight to the pit of hell. Chapter 2 verses uh, 10 and 11 
say that multitudes will be deceived because they did not receive the love of the truth. So they will believe what is false. They rejected the gospel. They rejected Christ. They rejected God's word. And because they do not have Christ, they do not have the knowledge of God's word. They don't have the wisdom that is in it. They don't have the spirit in them uh, to show them truth and error. They are going to be deceived and they're going to believe what is false. And here's the reason why. Because they've rejected the truth. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, They will all be judged because they rejected God and took pleasure in wickedness. That doesn't seem like it's very different than what we see today in our country. People rejecting God, people rejecting His Word, people rejoicing in and taking pleasure in and, and promoting, encouraging wickedness. And so all around us we see that this world is on a very slippery slope heading straight to condemnation. Now, we don't believe that this man of lawlessness has come yet. We don't believe that we are in these end times. But we certainly see these, these indications that we're moving closer and closer to that time period. And even though we're not in this time of great tribulation, we still see uh, evidences of it to come, and we still experience that around us, as there are many who are uh, we, we could say in the spirit and power of the man of lawlessness, but not the actual Antichrist. Many Antichrists have arise, uh, arisen, and, and we see their influence throughout um, the ages. And certainly that's not different today. There are many people today who are, are misleading people and, and uh, hiding the truth of God's word from them, and, and they are headed straight for condemnation. And so the church in Thessalonica, they knew this was coming, and it's very easy to see how they would be anxious, they would be a little depressed, they would be concerned about what's coming, because they might think that they were going to be victims of this kind of, of deceit and, and um, wickedness as well. You know, I mean, imagine what the Christians in Thessalonica were thinking when they read Paul's letter up to this point. It's a very frightening preview of what is to come. Uh, it seems to be an inescapable event, and the outcome seems to be uh, uh, sealed, guaranteed. And, and there is a way of escape, though, and, and Paul was giving his brethren that assurance that they would not endure this tribulation. Uh, there are some who will not be deceived by the man of lawlessness. There are some who will not stand judged before God. You see, these who escape this coming deception and judgment are those who are chosen and called by God. And that's the focus of our text today. It's not so much the end times, but it's the fact that Christians are chosen and called by God. You know, as Paul was writing this letter to his brethren, he was encouraging them. He was giving them assurance that, that the, the present and future trials, they, they could not and they should not rob them of their comfort and their strength and their assurance in Christ. And so he pointed out two very important acts of God in the past. Uh, and, and those acts of God were the exact thing that they needed to understand in order to find their hope, to, to have comfort and strength for the present and for the future. And it's these two acts of God that we're going to focus on today in our study. Because understanding what they are and, and what they mean, it will give you great comfort. It will give you great stability in a world that seems to be spiraling out of control. You know, as we, we look at our study this morning, I want you to understand, I, I hope that you understand that when you're facing difficult situations, you can and you should find your comfort and strength in the fact that you were chosen by God and called by God. Chosen in Christ and called in Christ. Now listen, don't miss the fact. We, we just spoke about tribulation and antichrist and persecution. And, and those things are coming. But as you see, if you look at the text, Paul quickly moved to prayer and thanksgiving. He didn't dwell uh, too much on the end times. He did tell them what was coming and who was coming and what it was going to look like. But he gave his brethren assurance that they had been chosen by God and called by God. And then Paul moved to prayer and thanksgiving. Prayer and thanksgiving is one of the best ways for us to stay focused and joyful. You know, when we're facing disappointment and despair, we have to think of all the reasons that we have to give thanks to our Lord. We, we need to dwell on, on the amazing and numerous blessings that we have in Christ. Paul focused on two of them, but there are so many that we can think of 
to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for these promises. Thank you for these blessings. But here in 2 Thessalonians 2, we're looking at the blessings of being chosen by God and called by God. Those two blessings are part of our new life in Christ. And so Paul, in a sense, was telling his brethren, don't worry. There is a wicked man coming. There are wicked times coming. This world is uh, on its way to condemnation. But you were chosen. You were called. You are a true follower of Jesus Christ. And for those reasons, you can have great joy and hope and comfort and stability, even though the rest of this world is on a quick path to condemnation. And so let's go ahead and uh, take some time this morning to kind of unfold and, and unpackage these truths and, and see the blessings that they are or they should be to us as we think about them and, and thank the Lord for them. Join me, if you would, as we open up in prayer. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word this morning. We pray that as we look at the truths of being called and chosen by you, uh, that we would understand that they are great blessings indeed. Open our eyes and ears and our minds to receive these wonderful truths, and I pray that we are strengthened by them, that we are encouraged, uh, that we will be able to stand strong in this world no matter what comes, and have clear vision, a clear understanding of what your word says, and that nothing in this universe, nothing in all of creation, whether it's seen or unseen, can take away the promises we have in you or change the love you have for us. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. As we look at the two aspects of being chosen by God, we see that they're broken down in this text in this way. First of all, we see that we are chosen from the beginning, and we'll answer uh, the question, the beginning of what, in just a bit. And then we are chosen for salvation. That is the, the purpose of why we are chosen. So if you look at the first point, it's more the, the timing of it. When did it take place? And then the second point is, why did it take place? It took place from the beginning, and it took place because God intended that we are saved through Christ, chosen from the beginning and chosen for salvation. As we look at these verses on screen, we see the first one from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And it says, He chose us, this is the Father chose us, believers, in Him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. This verse teaches that prior to creation, prior to the existence of this universe, before the foundation of the world, God chose us to be saved in Christ. And when we think of the beginning, we often think of John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 that speaks about the existence of Christ before anything else existed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. Our choosing by God for salvation took place before anything in all of creation existed. And when we think about time and we, we think about uh, God creating time, we understand that he's not locked into time. We are. We live in time. We can't go to the past. We can't go to the future. We only live in the present time. But that's not the case with God. God created time as we know it. And before time as we know it existed, God already had plans from the beginning uh, to save people to bring them to a place of glory, to save them through his son, Jesus Christ. And so Paul reminds his brethren, you were called by God. And this calling took place uh, long before the foundation of the world. You were chosen by God. When did that take place? Before the foundation of the world. And so his choosing and his calling, these are, we could say, eternal decrees. Uh, they have existed long before this universe ever uh, had even one second of existence. You know, when we think of God choosing us before the foundation of the world, before the universe existed, it really is an amazing thought. Uh, it's kind of this mind-blowing concept that 
that before we existed, before we had the opportunity to do good or bad, to worship God or to rebel against him, God had already determined that he was going to save people. His choosing, his calling is not based on our decisions or our actions. It is based on God's sovereign plan. It's based uh, according to his perfect purpose. You know, I often think about being back in, in uh, grade school and uh, when we're out there on the playground or out there on the field, uh, we divide up into teams to play sports, whether it's PE or on a lunch break or recess, whatever it might be. And, and you would have teams that were chosen. Well, I wasn't uh, always chosen first. In fact, that didn't happen until later on in high school when I was much uh, bigger than I was in grade school. Uh, in grade school, I usually got picked last or pretty close to last. You know, maybe you've experienced that. I don't know. Maybe you were one of the elite uh, in, in that group that were chosen first. Maybe you were even a team captain. I think it's safe to say that most of us were not those who were chosen first. Uh, when we think about God choosing, uh, he doesn't save, you know, the scraps for last. He doesn't look at, at someone and say, well, I guess I'm stuck with them. No, when God chooses a person, when, when, when a person is saved by Christ, uh, God's love and mercy and grace, and, and the love and mercy and grace that God has, they are beyond comprehension. In his infinite wisdom and in his infinite love and mercy, he, he has chosen people to be saved. He chose you. He chose me. If we are true disciples in Christ, he, he handpicked us to be his children. Uh, and, and that has to give us a, a very feeling of, of uh, great value, a great worth. You know, in this world, it's very easy to feel like you're not worth much. You know, we have the, the flaws that are within us, kind of those intrinsic flaws. We, we all know that we're flawed creatures. We don't need other people to tell us that. We understand that about ourselves. And yet sometimes other people do remind us of those things. Sometimes they're very cruel in their reminders. It's not, it's not a, a, a hard thing for us as people to be reminded on a regular basis just how imperfect we are. Uh, and, and that could make us feel like we are, are not worth being loved as well. But you know, when it comes to God's love, uh, we need to understand that, that he loved us so much, he loved his creation so much, that he chose to save people through Christ, even though he knew we were going to rebel against him. Whatever we did in the past, whatever we do in the present, whatever we, we will do in the future, God has chosen to save us in Christ. And those promises that we have, the, the entrance and the acceptance into God's family, that is a settled issue. Because God has determined from the past that the salvation we have in the present will continue on into the future. That is a genuine reason for comfort and security. You are not just chosen from the beginning, but you are also chosen for salvation, all according to God's wonderful, sovereign plan. And that actually is our next point. So let's go ahead and, and take a turn here and go to chosen for salvation. You know, when it comes to the topic of being chosen by God, some being saved by God, one of the objections that I've heard so many times is that's not fair. Why would God choose some people and not others? You know, many people reject the doctrine of election or God's choosing because they say it's not fair, that, that man has to have his, his fair opportunity to either choose or reject God. And, and the salvation has to be more on, on the basis of our decision, not God's, you know, kind of a, a random cavalier decision. But when you look at scripture, you cannot deny the fact that election, God's choosing, you find it throughout the pages of the Old and the New Testament. Here are a few verses to consider concerning the doctrine of election. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 14, it says, many are called, but few are chosen. There is this great call uh, that is put out to the world, the gospel call, but there are few who are chosen for salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 33, specifically speaks about the elect of God. 
who will bring a charge against God's elect? And in that passage, the answer is no one. Nobody can bring a charge, an allegation, an accusation against God's chosen people. It simply will not stand because God has sovereignly chosen them. He has elected them unto salvation. And nothing in this created order can change God's mind concerning those he has chosen. Another passage to consider that speaks about the choosing of God or the mercy of God upon people is Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 16. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Listen, if, if we want God to be fair with us, if we really believe that we want God to look at us and to assess our lives and to give to us what is just, what is fair, then he has to look at us and say, you are sinners. You deserve to be condemned. Listen, you don't want fairness from God, not when it comes to your salvation. If you want fairness, you and I both should be in hell right now. There's absolutely no question about that. We should not be here on God's earth, breathing in this air into our lungs, you know, polluting his planet one more day. We should be condemned in hell right now. And so we need to be thankful that God had mercy upon us that he has given us life, and not just life, but eternal life through Jesus Christ. You know, consider what the Bible says concerning the sin that we have against God and the consequences that it brings. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are no exceptions. Every person is a sinner before God, and we fall short of his glory. James chapter 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. If we think that we can be 99.999% good and that God is somehow going to look at us and say, you deserve salvation, we are wrong. If we sin even once in our thoughts, in our desires, in our actions, it's as if we are guilty of breaking every law of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. You want your fair wages? You're a sinner? Guess what? You deserve death. That is what is fair, physical and spiritual death. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Listen, God will not allow the guilty to go unpunished. Now, if we didn't have salvation in Christ, we would be doomed because we would be punished. But praise God that because he chose us from eternity past, because he had a plan to save people, and that plan included sending Jesus, his son, to the cross to bear our sins upon himself, to be punished as the guilty uh, um, individual that day, that, that Christ took upon himself our sin and our guilt, and he paid the penalty for our rebellion against God, and he absorbed all the wrath that was in store for us. So even when a person is saved, it's not as though their sins go unpunished. They were absolutely punished by God, but they did not... Uh, experience that punishment. It was Christ who experienced it for them. He took it for them. So either way, all the sin and the guilt of, of humans is punished by God. Either the individual uh, experiences their, their punishment upon themselves when they die and stand before God and are cast into uh, the lake of fire, or their sins were paid for punished by God through Jesus Christ on the cross. Make no mistake, every sin is punished by God.
You know, when it comes to the doctrine of election or God choosing people to be saved, uh, the question should never be, why did God choose some to be saved? Okay, that's the wrong question. And, and many people ask that question, why some and not others? Why this person and not that person? That is absolutely the wrong question. The question really should be, why would God choose any to be saved? Because just with the few verses that we've looked at this morning, it's very clear. Every person is a sinner. Every person stands condemned before God. The just uh, payment, the penalty for our sin is condemnation, is death, physical and spiritual. No one deserves to be saved. No one deserves to be chosen by God. So when an individual is chosen for salvation, that is an act of God's love and mercy. When an individual goes to hell because of their own sins, that is an act of God's justice. And God does not contradict himself with either action, whether it is choosing some to be saved or others going to condemnation because of their own sin. Either way, God is completely vindicated in what he does. He does nothing wrong by choosing some to be saved. You know, despite the fact that we are sinners and enemies of God prior to salvation, God acted in his perfect love and he made provision through his son, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10 is a beautiful passage that speaks about that truth. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. While it is true that God chose us uh, to be saved in Christ before the universe began, God chose to call people to salvation within the confines of time. And so God had determined before this world existed, I'm going to save people, but it is the gospel call that is given in this world. And that is where we as sinful humans are called to believe in Christ. We are called to trust in him, to place our faith in him, to respond to that call. And that's when that salvation is applied to us. It was determined in the past, but it was applied in what we would call our present. And, and so what a wonderful plan that God has, has designed and, and put into action in order to save his fallen creation. As Paul continued to write to his brethren, he emphasized the sanctification of the Christian. Sanctification is, is that choosing by God for a specific purpose, that is to be sanctified or to be set apart, to be set apart from this sinful world, to serve him, to be obedient to him, to glorify him with our lives. And, and you know, that is a, a rarely emphasized but greatly needed doctrine. Many people do not emphasize holiness, and that holiness is, is synonymous with sanctification. If you are going to be sanctified, you live holy lives. Uh, Peter made this clear in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And that brings us to the second reason to thank God when faced with trials and persecution and hardships. We are not only chosen by God, but we are called by God. You know, praise God that he, he called us to salvation, that he chose us before the foundation of the world. You know, and God called you, he called me through the proclamation of the gospel in order to share in the glory of Christ. One of those glories that we have in Christ is seeing people come to Christ. And that means that we share the gospel. We proclaim the gospel of Christ. We proclaim that salvation message to those who need that eternal life in Jesus Christ. 
But many have asked the question, well, if people are chosen for salvation by God before the foundation of the world, and we know they're going to be saved no matter what, then why do we have to share the gospel? What point is there in doing that? What purpose is there for us to share if God's going to save people anyway? Well, I think the answer is this. God chose to save people from eternity past. Before we existed, before the universe existed, God had already determined that he was going to save sinners. Not all of them, but he would save some. But he also determined that the way he would do that was to send his son into the world to be the Messiah, and the message of his son's messianic work was going to be proclaimed by people who have been saved. And, and so God chose not only to save us from eternity past, but God chose to use us as his heralds, as his ambassadors, to proclaim that saving message to the world. And so sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend everything God does and make sense of it as human beings. But I wholeheartedly believe that the Bible teaches God, in fact, did choose us, not based on our works, not based on our decision, but based on his sovereign purposes, his will. He chose us from eternity past to be saved, but he uses us in the present to proclaim the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Now, now that can drive you crazy trying to figure out how all of that works, but in God's mind and in God's time, all of that works perfectly with, with no contradictions whatsoever. You know, and that debate, that debate goes on between the groups that we identify or know as Calvinist and Arminian. Uh, the Calvinist will say that, that things like the sinner's prayer or the altar call are unbiblical. It puts too much emphasis on the sovereignty of man, the, the action of man. And the Arminian sees them as being valid and necessary. No, you have to pray, and, and, and these altar calls are absolutely genuine. You know, and I'm not here to debate that specific issue, but let me say this. I do see some validity to both views. Uh, scripture makes it very clear that there are no verbatim prayers that are to be said where it results in salvation. You will not find a sinner's prayer, uh, as we know it throughout history, in the pages of Scripture. You don't find altar calls in Scripture. But there is a clear understanding that a person must confess Christ and believe in Christ. Whatever that looks like, whatever words they use, there has to be that, that internal conviction that Jesus is who he says he is. They have to believe in him and call upon him to be saved. And, and doing so will result in salvation. You know, we can drive ourselves crazy trying to figure out all of the details uh, of election and, and salvation and, and and when that takes place and how that takes place and... and um, you know, thinking about God's sovereignty in that and man's responsibility to respond to Christ. And, and sometimes we can focus so much on that that we lose focus of just preaching the gospel. I, I like what Spurgeon said when he was asked about preaching the gospel uh, to everyone and not just to the elect. He said something like this. If God would have painted a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I would go around lifting shirts. But since he didn't, I must preach whosoever will, and when whatsoever believes, I know that he is one of the elect. Spurgeon's point was this. He believed that there were the elect who will be saved, but he had no idea who they were. And so he preached to everyone as if they were elect. And it would be left up to God to determine who was and who was not chosen for salvation. That wasn't for Spurgeon to determine. That's not for you or I to determine. When we are saved, we know, we can look at hindsight and say, I was one of those chosen people, one of the elect, but I don't know who is in this world. So I'm going to preach to everyone. I'm going to share the gospel with everyone as if they are the elect. And let God determine who was saved and when they will be saved. I will be obedient in the proclamation of that great and glorious gospel. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 15 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, 
Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. We are to preach the gospel to everyone, knowing that some are chosen for salvation and others are not. We do not know who is chosen or when a person will be saved. That work and that timing is for the Holy Spirit to decide. He is the one who opens the eyes for people to believe. He is the one who regenerates the person so they can have faith in Christ. We are called to preach the gospel. We are not called to determine who is and who is not chosen. We are not the ones who, who, who convince them to believe in Christ. We don't have that transforming power. We are to beg people to be reconciled to God through Jesus. And the fact that we have been chosen by God and called by God and put into his service, that should bring great joy to us because we know we don't deserve it. And yet he has been merciful and gracious to bring that beautiful message of the gospel to us and praise God that somebody or a number of people in the past were obedient to God and they shared the gospel with you and with me. And today our salvation is the result of that obedience and mercy of God as he has so generously and graciously determined to save people through Christ. So what is the gospel message? Well, here are a few good summary verses uh, from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. These two passages are some of my favorite verses in the New Testament because they really do summarize the entire gospel mission and message. You know, we are all called through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We as new people in Jesus Christ, we are to call others as we were called to trust in Jesus as Savior and to receive eternal life. Not only are we called to the gospel of Christ, but Paul says that we are called to gain the glory of Christ. So what does that mean to gain the glory of Christ? Well, to be called through the gospel, it identifies the means, the proclamation of Christ. Uh, to be called unto his glory, or to gain the glory, identifies again the purpose uh, or the goal of that, and that is glorification. And we'll touch on that just a little bit this morning, and we'll cover it later uh, in other studies in greater detail. So what is this glory that we are to receive, that we have been called to, that Paul speaks of? You know, I, I love the world that God has created. I love my life and I love my family and the things that God has given us in this world. And, you know, th this temporal dwelling and this temporal existence that God has made is something great. It is glorious, but it's not perfect. There is something greater and more glorious that is coming. And 1 Corinthians speaks of the resurrection to come, the new bodies, that time when we will see Christ with our own eyes, when we'll be set free completely from uh, the consequences of sin and death and temptation and all of the, the restrictions that this world brings upon us, all of the, the stumbling blocks as we try to walk on and, and persevere in our walk for Christ. Those things are going to be gone one day, and all of the frailties, all of the flaws, all of the limitations that we have in our human bodies, they will be gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 through 19 says this, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. 
And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we of all men are most to be pitied. You know, that really is an eye-opening verse. The great glory and hope that we have is resurrection. And that's because Christ rose from the dead. If Christ did not rise, then we have no hope of resurrection. And everything that we do, all of our faith, all of our, our giving to the church and missions and everything we do, prayers, they're meaningless. They mean nothing. That is one reason why the resurrection is such an important doctrine. Because Christ lives, we live today, and we will live in glorious bodies fit for heaven in the presence of our Savior. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 and 43, that it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. This is talking about our human physical bodies, that we die and we are buried and we return to the ground, so we are, are sown perishable and in a dishonorable way as we all taste death in this world. But when we are raised, we are raised in glory, that we rise in power as God gives us those resurrected bodies that are fit for dwelling with him forever in his presence. And that is why Paul says, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. The life that we have in Christ now, we are to live for his glory, but when we die, we don't lose anything. We transition to a life of gain. We leave this fallen and, and, and sinful world and the weaknesses of our humanity, and we inherit these wonderful promises of riches and glory and a glorified body, and we will reign with Christ forever. And so it makes perfect sense when Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. So when does this glory take place? We know now that we have the promises of the glory of Christ and we have salvation and we have so many blessings right now in Jesus Christ. But these new bodies and, and this glorious existence, it comes at a time that is known as the parousia of Christ or the coming of Christ. Peter speaks of that in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9 when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may, found, be, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And so Peter gives us this wonderful promise, this window into what glory looks like. But that doesn't take place until this glorious coming of Christ. We have to leave this world and we have to enter that eternal state when we are going to be with Christ forever and have the riches of his glory poured out upon us. And that is one of the great hopes that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. I really appreciate what John Stott wrote concerning God choosing us in the past. He says, in the eternity of the past, God chose us to be saved. Then he called us in time, causing us to hear the gospel, believe the truth, and be sanctified by the Spirit, 
with a view to our sharing Christ's glory in the eternity of the future. In a single sentence, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, the Apostle's mind sweeps from the beginning to the glory. There is no room in such a conviction for fears about Christian instability. Let the devil mount his fiercest attack on the feeblest saint. Let the Antichrist be revealed and the rebellion break out. Yet over against the instability of our circumstances and our characters, we set the eternal stability of the purpose of God. We declare with Paul, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you. You know, these teachings that we read in Scripture, like in 2 Thessalonians and in 1 Peter and other passages like them, they really are wonderful reminders that nothing in this world, not even Satan himself, can strip away the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the fact that we were chosen by God and called by God for salvation and sanctification and for glory, these are promises that are part of that bedrock foundation, that that firm anchor that holds our faith and our hope and our joy. We, we are, are so solid, rock solid in Jesus Christ and the promises of Scripture that nothing in this world can shake that. And, and the fact that God has determined to call us and to choose us before the universe even existed, um, we just know that that is a wonderful blessing. And, and it goes beyond you know, the, the boundaries of space and time as we know it. You know, so that's why Paul offered these wonderful truths to his brethren. Uh, he gave them the assurance that no matter what happens, even in the midst of the Antichrist in the end times, that nothing in this world could shake or, or thwart the plans of God or strip away the promises and the blessings of the glory and the salvation that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. But he didn't stop there. He gave his brethren a few words of application as well. Knowing what they know now about being chosen and called, Paul told his brethren that they needed to make sure that they were to stand firm on the truth of God's word. So here is Paul's application for his brethren and for us as well, coming from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. You know, this command to stand firm and to hold fast to truth, it's so important. He's telling them, look, there's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations, it's going to get worse, there's going to be a man of lawlessness. But the promises that you have are firm. Nothing can strip those away from you. So in light of that, in light of those truths that no matter how bad it gets, God is for you and he's going to keep you, he says, brethren, you need to stand firm. Hold on to the traditions that you were taught. He says, whether you heard it from my mouth or you read it in a letter, you know it's God's word, cling to it. And see, we have to do that as believers in Jesus Christ. We look to the written word of God. We look to our Bibles, Genesis to Revelation, and we read it, we study it, we apply it, we cling to it, and we know that it is God's perfect word and that every promise in it is guaranteed. And so we have that assurance that because God has chosen us and called us, we can stand firm and hold fast to the truth of his word. And so what a wonderful uh, exhortation, wonderful application in light of all that we know now about God's uh, calling and his choosing of us. You know, when I think of what Paul wrote about uh, holding fast and holding on, standing firm, uh, I think about an experience that I had at the beach one time. I was down at uh, Laguna Beach, a place called Treasure Island, and I was there with some of our youth from the church. We went on a, uh, a youth beach camp, and I wanted to take them out to the tide pools. And so I went out there to check everything out to make sure everything was good. The water was a little rough that day, so I just wanted to make sure I wasn't taking them into a dangerous situation. And uh, as I went out there, um, the water started to come in, the waves started to come in a little more one after the other as the set was coming in and and uh, I found myself literally between a rock and a hard place. There were the tide pools out there and then there was a very large rock uh, and then there was a channel of water behind it between the mountainside and that rock just offshore. 
And, and so as I looked around and I saw that the waves were coming in and I was too far to walk back to safety, I, I found myself going behind that huge rock. And that wall, that rock wall must have been at least 50 feet high. It was a, this huge rock. And as I went behind it, there was another rock in front of me, one that was maybe about 8 or 10 feet high. And uh, I, I could almost get my arms around it, but not quite. I mean, and so I was clinging to that rock. And as I, I was standing there, I was holding on. I know people were up above watching, kind of wondering what's going to happen. And uh, as I was standing on there holding on to that rock, uh, I, I knew the wave was coming in. And as it was surging in, I heard it hit the rock. And then you could, you could feel a little, bit, a little bit of that spray coming down. And then all the water just came down, one wave after another. There must have been four or five waves that came and just slammed into that rock. And I'm holding on for dear life. And, and I've got my, my feet anchored into the floor there, and I'm just clinging to that rock. Water's pouring over me. And uh, later on, I found out that people up on the, the cliff there, they thought I was going to get swept out to sea. They called the lifeguard, and so the lifeguard actually came down and, and came out to the tide pools where I was, and I was walking back. And uh, she said, you know, you, you really shouldn't be out here. The water's kind of rough today. And I'm like, yeah, I know that now. But uh, the point is, is I was there, and there was nowhere that I couldn't go. I couldn't walk back to shore. I couldn't go further out. I couldn't go behind that rock without holding on. So I just, I knew trouble was coming and I was just hanging onto that rock. And praise God, I was able to walk away from that really unscathed. There were a few little scratches on my arm from just holding onto the rock, but that was it, other than being soaked head to toe. You know, when we talk about the things that this world throws against us, all of the worldviews, all of the ungodliness, all of the uh, the, the different uh, differing ideas in the world that completely come into contrast with God's word. They, they stand as a polar opposite to what we know is true. And, and sometimes we have, uh, you know, political decisions that go against what we believe. Sometimes, uh, you know, government mandates. Sometimes it's a co-worker uh, who is saying, you know, not so nice things about you. Maybe it is an unbelieving spouse. Maybe it's unbelieving family or friends. Maybe you have children who aren't believers and, and they are attacking your faith. You know, whenever the attacks come, whatever form they come in and whatever degree they are, you need to cling to God's word. You need to go back to the word of God and cling to the truths, cling to the promises that are there for you. Because it's only when you cling to those truths uh, that you can withstand all of the trials of this life. And that's what Paul was telling his brethren. Things are bad, things are going to get worse, but understand this, you were chosen, you were called, and because of that, you can be unshakable in this world. And that means that we, we need to study the Word of God. We need to hold on to that written Word of God. We need to make sure that we're not reckless with the Word of God. We're not lazy with our study of Scripture. We have to be good students of the Word of God and defenders of the faith. There are so many false teachings out there. There are so many false teachers and, and philosophies and worldviews that are completely opposite to what God's Word teaches. And we cannot allow ourselves to be deceived by the false gospels and the false teachers that are out there. Until the day that He calls us home to glory, we need to stand firm in and hold on to Jesus Christ. And we do that primarily through embracing his word. Because when we study his word, we learn the mind of Christ. We learn the will of God. We understand his promises, his truths. And as we cling to those and we apply them, we live by them, we will bring glory to the name of God. We will grow in our spiritual walk. And we will be salt and light to those around us. So we need to make sure that we understand that. We cling to the word of God. And two of the promises that we really hold dear are the fact that we are chosen by God before the foundation of the world and called uh, unto God through Jesus Christ for our sanctification and unto glory. What wonderful promises we have that should bring great hope and joy to us every moment of every day. As we finish up our study today and look at the final verses uh, for our study, we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And here Paul is offering his kind of final words of comfort, at least in this section, for his brethren. And, and we are to take these as a message to us as well. Uh, he says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, 
comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Listen, God comforts and strengthens you so that you can practice what you preach. So, so that the, the, the promises that we say are true, we can live them because we know with certainty in our hearts and minds that they are true. We're not preaching a hypocritical gospel. We're not preaching an empty shell of a message. We proclaim the truth. Whether we preach it from the pulpit or you share it with a friend, we proclaim the truth of God's word. And God does his good work in us. He gives us that comfort. He gives us that strength so we can continue to apply what we have learned from Scripture. And so Paul prayed for his brethren. He exhorted the Thessalonians to stand firm, to hold fast. But if they would, uh, they would do so only by the strength of God. They can't do it under their own means, with their own abilities. The only way that they can do this, to stand firm and hold fast, is if they rely on the strength by God, uh, provided by God himself. And you see, it, it, it all goes full circle. God chooses us for salvation. He calls us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You accept that gospel when you hear it proclaimed. You stand firm and hold on. And the reason why you stand firm and hold on is because God has given you the ability to do so. It all comes back to that wonderful reminder of the sovereignty of God in salvation, the sovereignty of God in sanctification, the sovereignty of God in glorification. And praise God that he has been so good to us to supply everything that we need for life and godliness. That was Paul's reminder to his brethren, those great words of comfort that I offer to you this afternoon. Well, do you remember early on in the study that I had mentioned that kind of laundry list of the woes that uh, I had come across as I was going through my notes from several years ago? Uh, one thing that I didn't mention, and I saved it until the end, uh, was that I had also written down that just one week earlier, prior to all of these things kind of uh, bombarding us, all of these troubles and, and challenges, that there was an, an anonymous gift that was given to our family. Uh, somebody decided to donate some money to our, our family. I still never found out who that was. And uh, we had other plans for the funds, and that seems to be kind of the pattern of our lives. We had other ideas of what to do, but listen, God provided those funds. And at the time, we didn't know why they came or exactly how to spend them. So we were thinking about what to do with it. But God knew that in just a week's time, we were going to be hit with all sorts of challenges and expenses. And the amount of money that we received covered exactly the amount of the unexpected expenses, the medical co-payments, the root canal, and the tires for the van. I think there was a little bit left over maybe for dinner, but it was almost to the penny. Now, in the face of difficulties, of, of trials and tribulations that God uh, you know, uh, uh, sees us through, he always provides for us. Sometimes it is in monetary ways. Sometimes he'll provide the, the, the physical needs that we we, we need in that situation. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's help from someone else. You know, it, it all depends on the specific situation. But listen, even he, if he doesn't provide the, those physical means of getting through that, he always provides the spiritual. And that really is the greatest provision by God. You know, it's great when he provides the physical for the physical needs. And he often does that. And I always praise God when I hear stories and testimonies about that. But that's not guaranteed in Scripture. What is guaranteed is He will provide everything we need for life and godliness. He gives us what we need to stand firm in trials. He gives us what we need to maintain our joy when we encounter various trials. And, and even if we had not received that gift, which did cover the expenses, we would have been able to find our comfort and our strength in the fact that we have been chosen and called by God in Christ. That God loved us so much that he designed a plan to save us before we even existed, before the foundation of the earth, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you dwell on those truths and you understand just how much God has blessed you beyond what you deserve, beyond what we can comprehend, then the trials in this life seem to kind of fade away. They don't become as important in our minds as they once were. They're no longer those those issues that we fall apart over or we become anxious 
uh, or, or paranoid or, or frightened over because we understand that because God had a greater plan for us, that no matter what happens in this world, we are chosen by God and called by God and nothing will change that. Let me just close as I share one verse with you that uh, we did share this morning in our, our preaching service. And I think I shared it last week as well. And it really is a wonderful message. Uh, in fact, there's even a, a song about it or a song based on this passage. Maybe one day we'll sing that during one of our services. It comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And Paul writes, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, that is God's great promise to us of his unchanging love for his people. The people that he has chosen, the people that he has called, he has made those promises to love us. And I would say, not even until the end, because there is no end to his love. He will love us until the end of our lives here on earth, and then as we begin our new existence in his presence, his love for us will continue on into all the infinite future. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. Now listen, if you are watching today, and you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, and what I mean by that is if you are not saved, you have never humbled yourself, and you have never asked for that forgiveness, from Jesus uh, Christ and through Jesus Christ and from your sins, then you have that opportunity today. You have that opportunity to call upon God and, and say in so many words, whatever words you choose, as long as you understand what the truth is, that, that God, I am a sinner. I know this now. I realize this. I understand it. I know that you've created me. I know that I've rebelled against you. And I know that the only satisfaction for my sins, the only way for me to be saved from condemnation and to be right with you is through your son, Jesus Christ. And I believe in his work. I believe in what he did on my behalf. I believe that he went to the cross and paid the price for my sins. I believe that he rose from the grave and that I can have eternal life through faith in him. Listen, if you were not saved, but you want to be saved, you can just confess that to the Lord where you are right now in whatever words you choose and God will save you because all who call upon the name of Christ will be saved. There is no doubt about that. That is a guarantee from scripture. So I encourage you, you know, kind of assess where you are. If you've never been saved, you can have that salvation today and you can begin to experience new life in Christ. If you are saved, if you know that you have been chosen by God and called unto salvation, take comfort in the fact that God has chosen and called you for his perfect purposes and that nothing in all creation can take that promise from you. It doesn't matter what it is. Not even death itself can separate you from those promises. And so I know that we're facing difficult times in life and in our nation, but I just want to encourage you the way Paul encouraged his brethren. That, that dwell on these promises, dwell on these truths. You are chosen, you are called, and God's perfect plan will never be thwarted, not even by the situations today in your life or in our nation. Praise God that he gives us that assurance. Now we're going to close here. I'm going to pray in just a bit, and I encourage you uh, to go back through this study and look at these verses, study them once again, and, and, and see for yourself the truth of God's word. And uh, I'll be praying for you during this week. And, and Lord willing, we'll be able to come together again and uh, share in another video, uh, a Bible study next week. But if not, we might be in his presence in glory. And that would be far better. Because remember, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. And I pray that as we have looked at it this morning, that I have been faithful to share it with accuracy and that we believe it with full conviction, that we would take these truths, apply them to our lives, act upon it, and be stronger for it. Father, if there's someone out there today who wants that salvation, I pray they would humble themselves and reach out to you and just ask for that reconciliation through your Son. Father, and for those of us who are believers in Christ, strengthen us, give us greater confidence than we've ever had, and assurance and joy knowing that we are chosen and called by you and that nothing in all of creation can separate us from that love. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining me. 
and I look forward to seeing you again soon.